So, I'm going to tell you an extraordinary story uh, that has really helped me to appreciate the importance of free expression, a right that uh, before all of this happened, I was not concerned about at all. I felt that, you know, here in Canada I could say whatever I wanted and that there would be no uh, repercussions or retaliation for any of my views. However, <laughs> my story today will show you um, what um, has happened to freedom of expression uh, in Canada. So, uh, I'm going to tell you the story of my dangerous art. Now, this was uh, a show, uh, actually, this show I just had at um, Performance Works uh, in Gastown, or not in Gastown, on Granville Island. And uh, BC Civil Liberties uh, hosted it, which was tremendous. And why would they, a nonpartisan organization, uh, support my work? And it's because they support my right to speak out uh, and freely express myself. So one of the big problems that we have in Canada is that most Canadians don't think our free expression is at risk. And also, the words free expression. So, what is free, free expression? Free expression is really the right to be able to uh, speak up and voice your opinion, right? Without uh, someone, uh, you know, uh, whacking you down. <coughs> now, uh, Bill C-51, the new law that's just come into place, has drastically expanded the definition of security. And this is one of the reasons that I think that Bill C-51 should be uh, repealed. Uh, now, the quote that I'm going to read you is from uh, BC Civil Liberties, and it's a blog post that they did on uh, things that you need to know about Bill C-51. When you think of being secure, you likely think of being safe from physical danger. But Bill C-51 defines security as not only safeguarding public safety, but also preventing interference with basic, with various aspects of public life or the economic or financial stability of Canada. That means that if you interfere with the economic stability of Canada, you know, you uh, could get into uh, trouble and be labeled a security risk. So I'm going to tell you my, uh, a couple of stories from my book, Band on the Hill which was uh, published in 2013. And uh, let me just read Bill McKibben's quote because it's so good. Uh, the Canadian government has clamped down on scientists who tell the truth about the tar sands, and it's tried to shut up artists too. Happily, Frankie James is indefatigable. And that's Bill McKibben, founder of 350.org. Does everyone know 350.org here? How many people actually have heard of 350.org? Okay, so a pretty good crowd. All right. So this story starts back in 2011. Band on the Hill. I didn't make his fishing buddies list, but I did make his please donate money list. Despite me screaming, Eric, please put me on your do not call list. But making Harper's blacklist is something I never dreamed of. Who would have thought I could get into so much trouble by writing a letter to my dear Prime Minister in 2008 asking him to make polluters pay? So this is one of the spreads from my um, letter to Harper in 2008. You say the other parties are dangerous because they will tax polluters. But if we don't tax polluters, who will pay to clean up the mess? Will my children and yours be paid? I never thought it would get me into such a pickle. And I really love like putting in these things so people, like readers, have to actually think of what the words are. Because I was always taught to speak up, growing up in a family of seven kids. And I read today that Thomas Mulcair is one of ten kids, and he's number two. So he said that. He knows how to uh, speak over anybody. <laughs> and the funny thing is, if an educational nonprofit in Croatia hadn't asked to buy my art for a touring show in Europe, wow, my 
big dream, a solo show to inspire students to make art about climate change. And these were the 20 cities it was supposed to go to. And my art was traveling, not me. Copenhagen, Moscow, Vienna, Istanbul, Barcelona. It was amazing, amazing show that was being planned. And it was supposed to be sponsored by corporate sponsors and private sponsors. And unbeknownst to me, the NGO thought that she would go and get some support from the Canadian Embassy because, after all, this artist is from Canada. Why wouldn't they want to support a Canadian artist who is being honored in this way? So the plans all changed one fine day in May when the NGO called me about a delicate matter. I don't want to step on anyone's toes, Sandra said. Sandra got a call from the cultural officer at the Canadian Embassy in Croatia. Meet me at the coffee shop, the official whispered. This is off the record. Don't you know this artist speaks against the Canadian government? Oh my goodness, why would she say that, I said. Oh, Ottawa is very unhappy with your visual essay to the Prime Minister. So this is another one of the spreads. The tar sands is Canada's largest and fastest growing source of greenhouse gas pollution. And actually, the uh, federal government changed the way that they calculate emissions. So now uh, the tar sands is only the fastest growing um, source of greenhouse gas pollution. And I can understand that it's off message from the government's point of view. Word is, that when a top official in Ottawa heard about my show, he said, who's the idiot who approved of an art show by that woman, Frankie James? And I imagine he looked like this. <laughs> Which really took me aback. I didn't know the government knew who I was, let alone hated me. I'm the little cockroach there. Incredibly, I am being blacklisted, and I've got a lot of company. Many, many people have been blacklisted by the Harper government. We can see Munir Sheik, uh, the uh, Errol Mendes, Linda Keen. Anyway, all of these are documented on a site called Voices Walk. Anyway, incredibly, I am being blacklisted for disagreeing with my leader's grand vision for Canada to become an energy superpower and use the sky as a sewer. Fast forward two and a half months, and my once-in-a-lifetime European tour got canned. The, in the press, the government denied any interference. Funding was never withdrawn, nor was it guaranteed. Allegations of a political conspiracy against Ms. James are a fantasy of her own making. But actually, the government did approve my show, because I applied for access to information documents. And I got the proof. I got the proof that the show did receive a little bit of funding. $5,000 in funding was approved, and it was approved under the advocacy budget to support climate change education uh, in other countries. And that's part of the UN FCCC agreement. But then the climate office killed it in this really Orwellian twist. It was actually the deputy director of the Climate Change Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Jeremy Wallace, who said, we would not not recommend funding for this project. But we can't see why he would not not recommend funding. <laughs> because it's blacked out for uh, section 15.1, reasons of international security and the defense of Canada. I didn't know my art was that dangerous. And then, this is beautiful. So this is not part of my book because this is new information that I just got in 2015. So if we go back to that letter, you see the part that's blacked out? Okay, so here's what it says under that redaction. It says, we would not not recommend funding for this project, especially in light of the current context and the extremely sensitive nature of the climate change issue. We don't want to educate people about climate change impacts. <laughs> the current context that uh, I think Jeremy Wallace is referring to in this case 
was that the EU was voting on whether or not to label tar sands oil dirty. And it was inconvenient for me to be having a show at that time. It was off message from the government's point of view. Therefore, they decided that they would uh, do everything that they could to warn people away from supporting my show. So I got this unredacted thanks to the Office of the Information Commissioner, which I'll tell you more about, but we're going to get back to the story. It wasn't the government funding that was withdrawn and would only have paid for a few postage stamps. The thing that killed the show was the government putting a black mark on me, which created a ripple effect, scaring away venues and sponsors. And finally, even the NGO who couldn't stand to be in the crossfires of Canadian politics. The NGO called it a Don Quixote fight and advised me just to give up, particularly as the exhibitions had been canceled. But I didn't want to give up. I actually wrote to the Canadian embassies myself because I thought, well, I'm a Canadian citizen. Surely they're not going to turn me away. And I asked to rent space at any of the Canadian embassies. And initially, they were interested. But then word came from Ottawa, and I was not even given a handshake. How can I fight back against the Harper government? It's huge and powerful and rolling in oil money. And I'm only one person. But this is so wrong. The government should not be warning people not to exhibit my art. I may be small, but I need to speak up. I need to shine a bright light on this dark deed. And I am not going to give up. Because Canada is still, by a thread, a free country. <laughs> So I turn to Twitter. And how many of you are on Twitter? Twitter is fabulous. I love Twitter. It's amazing. And you know, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'll follow you back. Amazing things happened thanks to social media and Twitter. Uh, this lady, who coincidentally is from BC, uh, Catherine Wellner, started um, a petition. And almost 5,000 people wrote to the Harper government protesting. Um, their attempts to silence me. And the Toronto Star uh, did an article and actually interviewed myself and Sandra Antonovic from uh, Nectarina in Croatia. And the Ottawa Citizens, you know, marvelous, marvelous development. So they applied for access to information documents at the same time I did. And in their first story, um, the government didn't tell them the truth. So they went back, they wrote a new story based on the new documents which they had, and they boldly were able to state government officials killed funding for Canadian arts, and that's what the document showed. So that was really nice. And I got tons and tons of media. And yet, many of you in this room are only of hearing this story for, for the first time today. How many of you it's the first time? Right. So why did the message spread on social media and why were people coming forward? They were coming forward because we have common concerns. Concerns about free speech, social justice, the environment, freedom of expression, pollution, transparency. <coughs> So I was figuring out, like, how do I fight the government on this? And I uh, spoke to a lot of different people. And one guy I asked, David Hodgson in San Francisco, said, you should call this guy Colin Mutchler. Um, and because uh, he uh, has a billboard crowdfunding company that might be able to help you out. And he was the perfect guy to talk to. And I had a video meeting with Colin, and he said, hey, wouldn't it be funny to put your art in Ottawa, like right where the Prime Minister could see it? And we imagined it being uh, like on Sussex Drive. But they don't have any bus shelters that uh, we could buy on Sussex Drive. And I imagined that it would sort of look like this, and this would be the reaction uh, in Ottawa. So 
I started a crowdfunding campaign, and this is a tweet from one person who is saying, put your money where your heart is. So anyway, there was an outpouring of support on social media, and people um, uh, contributed to my crowdfunding campaign. And uh, we had 82 supporters who came forward and contributed a little over $4,000. And I wanted to send this message to Ottawa. Please stop blacklisting our environmental messengers. Artists and scientists are the planet's early warning system. Remember, this was 2011, right? And we've still got the same stuff happening now in 2015. So here it was. I actually managed to get the posters up in Ottawa. And it was like so much fun because they were right around the corner from the Parliament buildings. Now, why are we having such a hard time getting the message out about climate change? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, the government instituted a new communications policy in 2007 at Environment Canada. Um, and they said, just as we have one department, one website, we should have one department, one voice. So any reporter who wanted to speak to an Environment Canada scientist had to go through a single communications person. And the end result of this is that media coverage of climate change science has been reduced by over 80%. Harper can muzzle government scientists, but controlling the message from individual citizens, artists like me, isn't so easy, especially with social media. That's why governments around the world are afraid of artists and social media. Because our voices joined together have the power to change governments. If Harper knew the Canadians wanted him to change from this, Canada is a dirty old man, and that was the Guardian saying that, to this, Canada is a leader in clean, green energy, and that it will be the source of his sustainable power well, Harper could turn green overnight. And he would ponder the cruel irony that fossil fuels may cause the extinction of mankind. And um, again, I put in these little visual jokes. So we've got uh, mankind stomping on humanity. <laughs> kind. He would stop loafing and get to work on reducing CO2. But that won't happen unless we exercise our power. Write your own dear Prime Minister letter. Tell him why going green is the only sane thing for Canada. Tell him why it will be good for his children. Tell him why it will help him hold on to power. And why history will look kindly on him as a leader. Canada, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Canada was a colossal fossil before Harper saw the error of his foolish ways and repented. And how our great leader restored our reputation as a cold country where polar bears roam and where even folks from Toronto can play hockey outdoors on real ice. And everyone is nice and very polite. And we never tell people to shut up. Because that's just not Canadian. And so this was back November 2011. And it was just, it was like something out of a Hollywood movie. It was unbelievable. We figured that there must be a fix in here somewhere because just two days before, on Halloween, I actually got the first batch of access to information documents. And those first 165 pages contained the evidence that the government had actually approved my show and then had uh, killed it, that the Climate Change Office at Department of Foreign Affairs had canceled it. And Elizabeth May, and God bless her, <laughs> although is that the right thing to say here? Anyway, <laughs> Frankie James commitment, <coughs> sorry, to art, free expression, and political commentary, put her in the crosshairs of the Harper government. Come and see what the government didn't want the world to see. Elizabeth May. So that was November 2nd, 2011. And I approached all of the opposition parties, the NDP and the Liberals and the Green Party. And it was only the Green Party that had 
the courage to step forward and support me. And so I think that the uh, Liberals and the NDP have some explaining to do. But uh, anyway, uh, hopefully whoever is leading, uh, if it's the Liberals or the NDP, uh, will be a strong voice for free expression because they weren't there for me when I needed them. And I was interviewed uh, on the streets of Ottawa by Sun uh, News, which was kind of fun. And uh, you know, uh, university students from Montreal were doing a documentary on uh, censorship. And here are some of the posters. So that's that story. And now I'm going to read you another story. Now I wrote this story in uh, 2013. And, uh, but it's based on um, the new information which I had gotten in, uh, that had been uh, written in, in 2011. Frankie James is your fault. Yes, so let me back up. Yes, well we can see it this way as text, or we can see it this way. Frankie James is your fault, and I'm uh, in a cloud of emissions from Fat Cat Canada. <laughs> I was shocked to discover Thomas Marr's email rant with this undiplomatic subject line, Frankie James is your fault. Suddenly, I was a scandal. So this is an actual email thread uh, from Thomas Marr, obtained under access to information. And you see all of the stuff that's blacked out, that's redacted. And it's redacted for, some is for personal reasons, but some is for reasons of international security and the defense of Canada, and advice to a minister or about government policy. So, Frankie James is your fault. Who was this guy? Thomas Marr is a trade commissioner at the Canadian Embassy in Berlin. He used to be the ambassador to Croatia, which is how he knew Vladka at the Canadian Embassy in Croatia. Mar wrote to Vladka asking if I was her fault. He wrote, Nectarine, a nonprofit, is a Croatian organization, and you have connected them with Ms. James, who has a green conscience? Do I look like a green headed monster? There must have been a big stink on the hill. And this is an email from uh, Scott Hetherington, who's another ambassador. And in this email, he's saying um, to please take a look at my essay, Fat Cat Canada. And the Fat Cat Canada essay is all about the tar sands. It's really, it's a scathing um, review of it. And we got, thanks to the Office of the Information Commissioner, so I'm going to go back. You see the stuff that's blacked out. Okay, so now, thanks to the stuff that I got in 2015. And this letter was written in 2011. Okay, so here's what we found out that he was saying. He says um, that he would not uh, feel comfortable supporting uh, this initiative due to controversial views on energy issues, particularly the oil sands. And that's, that was covered up under international security and the defense of Canada. Anyway, I thought, you know what, this Frankie James is your fault is a pretty, you know, undiplomatic and, and outrageous title. Maybe um, I should use it as my book title. So I tried some cover concepts. Nah, too scary. But the heavily blacked out email spoke volumes. I decided this would be the best cover. I sent it to a few friends to hear their thoughts. Most gave it a thumbs up, but some were dubious. People won't get it unless they hear the backstory. And I was imagining all the donut shops and coffee shops across the country. And I thought, that would be a shame. I want people to hear how free expression is being squashed to serve the oil industry's agenda. So I sent an email to Elizabeth May. What do you think of the title? Is it great? She shot back, I'd go even more radical. Bound and gagged, why Stephen Harper banned Frankie James. And I thought, well, 
you know, it's a powerful title, pretty catchy, but it sounds a little S and M. <laughs> there was nothing kinky, just creepy secret interference by Canadian bureaucrats, paid for by taxpayers. The official secretly warned Nectarina not to exhibit my art. Don't you know this artist speaks against the Canadian government? Which is really shocking. Because my art was to inspire students to make art about climate change. But the government secretly interfered and the show was cancelled. Internally, they said, and this is obtained under access to information, the artist's work dealt mostly with climate change and was advocating a message that was contrary to the government's policies on the subject. Jean Bruno Villeneuve's spokesperson. This was an internal email. He did not think that I would ever see it. But when I saw it, I thought, that's terrible. What he is actually telling me is, you know, that uh, not to talk about climate change. If art has to agree with government policies, then art is government propaganda. I sent Harper this message in November 2011 to please stop punishing our environmental voices. But he didn't listen. Since then, things have gotten worse. Scientists are protesting being muzzled, and that evidence is being buried, and they've got some great symbolism there. People will get it right away. The coffin, the uh, scythe, brilliant, Grim Reaper. If the evidence is hidden, how can we make informed choices? And this little factoid really bugs me, okay? A parliamentary committee suddenly destroyed drafts of a final report on tar sands pollution. Why? It seems that the government has been hiding from the truth. Indigenous peoples are protesting. Canada, what's going down? People are fleeing from a toxic land with high rates of cancer around the uh, tar sands. Even librarians are being silenced. There's a chilling code of conduct at the Library and Archives Canada, and that they issued this press release saying that it is unacceptable and unnecessary interference with freedom of expression. Uh, so the code lists teaching, speaking at conferences, and other personal engagement as behaviors considered high risk for conflict of interest. Well, you know what? That is so good. I don't work for the government. So they can shut up the scientists and the librarians, but they can't shut me up. And we could just look back at Orwell from 1946, and he wrote, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable, and to give an appearance of solidity to pure win. And that is so true. Dr. David Schindler of the University of Alberta, who's a world-famous scientist, uh, says, believing in clean oil sands is like believing in magic fairies. Why are people allowed to lie to the public like this? I just don't understand it. We have to challenge them. Obviously, the people who used to challenge them, the civil servants, are no longer allowed to. And that was in the Ottawa Citizen in April of 2013. Hi there. Hi. Orwellian Ottawa. Dirty oil is clean. Nature is bad. Lies are truth. Even citizens are being gagged with red tape to prevent them from speaking up at pipeline hearings. More artists are facing censorship threats for opposing big oil. This was a show at uh, Calgary City Hall, and it didn't get shut down, but it almost did because the oil industry was lobbying uh, Cal uh, Calgary City Hall to, to close it down. I told Harper one thing. You're infringing on my right to freedom of expression. And the government said, literally, and this is from an access to information document. They never thought I was going to see it. I don't believe it is in our responsibility to address the charter claims Ms. James is making. Jean Bruno Villeneuve, spokesperson, Foreign Affairs. So I thought, well, I've got to tell people um, what the government is doing. So I created this poster. Do not talk about climate change. It is against Canada's policy. And what you're seeing here is the uh, parliament buildings uh, dropped into 
the tar sands. And Jean Bruno's quote is featured right here. So people can understand that my headline, Do Not Talk About Climate Change, is actually supported by the evidence. And we'll read that quote again. The artist's work dealt mostly with climate change and was advocating a message that was contrary to the government's policies on the subject. In short, do not talk about climate change. So who is responsible? If the government isn't responsible for protecting our charter rights and our land from sea to shining sea, hey, isn't it time we asked each other, is Stephen Harper your fault? Let's admit our mistakes in book titles and prime ministers and move on. Tell Harper we've had our fill. We will not be banned on the hill. Canada belongs to all of us. So um, that story, both of those stories that I read you today are in my book. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, my uh, battle um, for freedom of expression. And it really has been a battle. And it's, uh, it's been challenging, um, but it's also been fun and educational. <laughs> so uh, objectively, we can see that CO2 is rising, and that it's now almost at 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. Or we can see it, so we can see it through that scientific chart, but we can also see CO2 keeps rising, but our leaders keep loafing. Will they take action before we're all toast? So I'm not the only person that is telling Canada that we need to have uh, a carbon tax and reduce our carbon emissions. We can see that in 2014, the United States and China reached a landmark carbon emissions deal. And just recently, China made a carbon pledge ahead of the Paris Climate Change Summit. And this is a really significant one. They pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by 60 to 65 percent from 2005 levels. So that's a lot more ambitious than what Canada has pledged. And we've got Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne coming forward and saying that Harper is blocking climate reform. Now we all know that. But it's good to see someone like Premier Wynne stepping forward and saying it publicly to the media. So when my book first came out in May of 2013, I was so honored that the first newspaper to write about it was The Guardian UK. And they have tremendous coverage on the environment. So um, they interviewed me, and the story they wrote up, the headline, really nailed it. Artist finds inspiration in Canadian government's attempt to silence her. But the interesting thing is that I shared it with a few people uh, in direct message privately on Twitter. And this anonymous Canadian NGO said to me, Thanks, I can't share the good news because it could jeopardize our charitable status, but I wish you the best. So here we have um, a Canadian NGO who is being muzzled because they're afraid that they're going to lose their charitable status. And that is terrible. But again, it just shows that there is a role for individuals like me who step forward, we're not employed by the government, I'm not employed by a, by a news agency, and so I can't be fired. So when the book first came out, I decided that I was going to do a crowdfunding campaign again, and I made the pitch. I want you to join me in showing Harper that blacklisting and censoring citizens does not work, especially if they wield a paintbrush. And in a period of very short time, I think it was about 30 days, we raised almost $13,000 mm -hmm. on Indiegogo from 221 funders. And again, we've got this uh, poster, Do Not Talk About Climate Change. And that enabled, the funding enabled me to put that poster up in Ottawa, Halifax, and Calgary. 
So yeah. it really, really stretched, and it was great. And it got tons of media, and I was really pleased that it really raised the issue of censorship and what the government is doing. But then, really, really fun, um, I was able to put it on the streets of Washington, D.C., thanks to the help of some nonprofits down in uh, Washington, and also a little bit of the funding that was left over from the Indiegogo. And uh, my show in uh, Washington was called uh, Ono oh Canada. The uh, No Keystone XL, this is one of the posters. And you can see it on the streets of Washington, D.C. And uh, I spoke at a press conference down in Washington, and David Suzuki and Sephora Berman joined me, which was tremendous support. And here's one of the posters, Canada is a Dirty Old Man, again picking up on the Guardian's quote and showing uh, Harper as a uh, oil barrel, a church coat wearing oil barrel. And another one, Oh Canada, what's going down? And then I love to see that uh, people are actually seriously looking at these. Canada's carbon pollution is rising and the emissions. So. One of the things that, uh, one of the chapters in my book is called Games Bureaucats Play. And I learned a lot by uh, applying for access to information, but I also realized that most people would not have the patience, the diligence to do what I had done. So I thought, how can I make this really fun and entertaining and teach people about access to information and the dirty tricks that the bureaucrats are playing? So I wrote this chapter, and it is really fun, and it's actually being published in a new book that's coming out called uh, Access to Information and Social Justice uh, by Kevin Walby from the University of Winnipeg and Jamie Brownlee from Carleton. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but uh, some of the tricks you may recognize. Uh, the hot potato, sit on it, cover your ass, uh, stupid cat tricks, peekaboo, so this is the um, uh, Prowler's one. So what did I call it exactly? Peekaboo. Yes. And uh, so when you get access to information documents, you're going to get e lots and lots of emails. And you'll see uh, in the emails, you'll see the subject line, who it's to and who it's from. But if you're lucky, you're also going to see the CC list. And I looked at that CC list and I went, who are those people? And why are they interested in um, my story? <laughs> so I used Google and other search engines to find out who the people are. And uh, here are some of the people that are looking at my files. We've got uh, Sylvie Blay, uh, Cabinet and Parliamentary Affairs Division from Department of Foreign Affairs. We have the Director General of Communications for Department of Foreign Affairs. We've got Stuart Wheeler, Director of DFA Cabinet Relations Division. So these are some real heavy hitters. And this is a tiny fraction of the people who are looking at my file. I mean, really, how ridiculous is that? What a waste of taxpayer dollars. Yeah. And I was, uh, you know, I had spent like two years, from 2011 to 2013, putting in access to information requests. I got over 2,000 documents, but some of them were redacted, and that really bugged me. And it didn't matter how much I complained, um, the Office of the Information Commissioner said, listen, we can't do anything, those are high-level redactions, just, you know, you, you, you have to have a high-level investigator, and there are only eight of those in Canada who can see what's under those redactions, so give up. Well, I didn't give up. What I did was I wrote to Suzanne Legault, who's the head of the Office of the Information Commissioner, and I said, you've got to look into this. The reason I was censored should make all Canadians angry, because it threatens the very essence of democracy, our right to speak up and disagree with our elected government. And you know what? She agreed. And within one week of my letter going into her, she launched an investigation. But remarkably, it took two years to actually get anything from the Office of the Information Commissioner. So the key word here is patience.
patience and perseverance. So in uh, March of 2015, uh, the Ottawa Citizen did a terrific article about the findings from the Office of the Information Commission. And they didn't actually get everything unredacted. They just got some of the stuff unredacted. But what they got unredacted is very helpful. And uh, so here I, I'll just read my quote from that article. What is surprising and so shocking with the latest disclosures is that, is that they're using high-level security clauses in order to black out stuff which is partisan and embarrassing. These guys have been abu abusing that exemption clause. In my case, they're blatantly covering up stuff. And they're trying to smear people. So one of the, um, uh, two of the letters actually that got unredacted, um, one phrase was uh, that I was being, um, uh, it was because of the artist views on the oil sands that I could not rent space at the Canadian Embassy. And so I thought, you know, what they're actually telling me is the artist views. So it's not even what I'm producing, it's what I'm thinking. So it's not, do not talk about climate change. They've taken it to a whole new level. Do not think about climate change. So this is my latest poster that's just done in the last month. And we see the Parliament buildings, uh, not in the tar sands, but in the Arctic, which is the next uh, place that they want to do drilling, and it's on an oil rig, and we see uh, an emaciated polar bear. And that emaciated polar bear is, um, that's a wonderful photograph that I have obtained permission to use from the Norwegian photographer who, who shot that bear in, uh, up in the Arctic. And uh, she was very concerned about the impact of climate change on uh, polar bears. And this is uh, the quote that's featured on the, uh, on the poster. James complained to the Office of the Information Commissioner. The Department of Foreign Affairs recently relented and removed some of the redactions. The new versions of the documents show that much of the official concern over funding James and promoting the European art tour was based on the polarizing politics of climate change. In one, a departmental trade official notes that a Canadian diplomat in Europe would not help promote the show because of the artist's views on the oil sands. Ian McLeod, Ottawa Citizen. So I thought, you know what? I need to do a new series of posters to help people to understand really quickly what the government is doing. So my most recent exhibition featured these um, posters. Uh, and I call it six easy ways to crush free expression. So here we've got flag activists, and uh, in this case, it's the email from the trade commissioner saying um, that the artist views on the oil sands are the reasons that she's not allowed to um, rent space at the Canadian embassy. But she's doing more than just highlighting my views. What she's doing is she's telling the people in this email to send it to uh, the communications department in Ottawa. So she's flagging me for monitoring and spin control um, by the media department at Foreign Affairs. Then we've got redacting the truth to conceal censorship. And uh, so um, this is too small for you to be able to, to see properly, but um, in the top part, we have a wonderful uh, letter from Ambassador Edwin Laughlin, and he's expressing his sincere regrets that he can't support the climate change exhibition, which Nectarina had asked for a little bit of funding on. And we don't know why, um, you know, he's, he, he can't support it, because he's only saying very nice things. Um, but then, we have these lines that are redacted. So, thanks to the Office of the Information Commissioner, it got unredacted. And what does it say? It's just, the reasons for this decision are not something that we are able to put in writing. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> now, the, um, uh, it just seems like, I was going to call this redacted truth to conceal uh, stupidity. Um, but it is actually redacting the truth to conceal censorship. So 
they can't even put the reasons in writing why um, they can't support my show. And so this again is avoidance um, of accountability. They won't write things down. Classify art as a threat to national security. Now this is a really, really interesting one because we've got that letter from Thomas Marr. Uh, Frankie James is your fault. And you know what? The Office of the Information Commissioner could not get the Department of Foreign Affairs to unredact even one word. Not one word. The whole thing is blacked out. And I find this just unconscionable. The, uh, you know, what are, what are these guys going to do now that they've got the powers of Bill C-51? They're already abusing um, the uh, powers of redaction uh, right now. And, uh, you know, this is really, really dangerous. I mean, this is ridiculous to have uh, a letter like this that says, Frankie James, it's your fault, and they cannot get any of it unredacted. So, the next one, so contempt to justify hatred. So this is another tactic that the government is using. And you'll see it all the time in the media, right? What they do is they trot out their government spokesperson to say something about an issue. So in my case, um, the government spokesperson back in uh, July of 2011 said, Allegations of a political conspiracy against Miss James are a fantasy of her own making. There was no political interference in this decision. Nice. Right? So the average reader would read that and go, well, I'm on the government's side. She's a flake. Right? And yet it's taken me four years and an awful lot of work to get 2,000 documents which show that there was political interference. And we can see that high-level people from ambassadors uh, in cabinet relations have been involved in my case. Shut her down. No one will know. So this one is really interesting because uh, the fact is that if uh, the uh, nonprofit in Croatia had not told me what the government was doing behind the scenes, I would never have known. You know, I would have just said, oh, well, the show is canceled. I was like, I don't know, right? But it was because they value, in Croatia, they value freedom of expression so much that when they saw my right to freedom of expression being trampled, they spoke up. They told me. Now, they didn't know that I was going to fight it so hard as I did, uh, but they told me. And that got me on the path to uh, dig for the evidence so that I could go public and tell everyone. And uh, so, and the final uh, of the six is blacklist everybody who questions our policies. And uh, if you do some digging on Voices Wa and uh, some research, you can see that this is a technique uh, that is being used by the Hartford government. In fact, uh, there was a, a scandal maybe about uh, 18 months ago or so where Hartford's enemy list was in the news. But we've all forgotten about that because now we're in a, an election cycle and all we're worried about is uh, the kneecap debate. So, how would I get mentioned in an article <laughs> with Neil Young? Okay, so I have Margaret to thank for this. So, um, Press Progress uh, put me in number three as one of five Canadian artists who rocked in 2013. And the reason for that honor is I took my critique of the Harper government and its inaction on climate change to Washington, D.C., drawing truth to power and uh, on other issues. So, that was great. And then this is really rewarding. Uh, my case is now being used as uh, an example in, uh, to be taught in schools. How cool is that? Yeah. So uh, a recent um, textbook on censorship by Scholastic Canada, uh, and this is available for students uh, from six to grade six to nine, to discuss the issues of censorship. And they've really got, I think, a good, a good question. 
and it was, um, does the government have the right to shut down an artist if the artist makes the government look bad? So I think that there would be some pretty interesting conversations going on in uh, classrooms. And the most important thing to say today is please get out and vote to protect your rights and please bring your friends and neighbors and talk to people about whether or not they're going to vote. We've got to really get out there and um, vote to protect our rights. So thanks very much. <laughs>